What's up, you guys? Marty Schwartz here with Marty Music, and I'm honored to be hanging out with Joe Glazer, luthier, repairman, inventor. Thank you for letting us in to your uh, workshop. Is that what you call it? Yeah, yeah, this is the shop. You, know, you work with the whole community of music, so uh, I think it's gonna be really cool to show people out there what goes on, you know, behind the scenes here. How do you describe what you do? This is where I hang out. Yeah. I do travel a lot. I do a fair amount of consulting and teaching and stuff, but it all bases out of here. And the day-to-day -day in here is taking care of the players. Our clientele's not exclusive, but it turns out because we're in this little city of Berry Hill and yeah. because we're in Nashville and everybody goes through Nashville, Nashville's not a country music town. Town. It's a music town. Yeah. It's music city. That's something, not being from Nashville, something I, that's been exciting to learn is the diversity in music. It wasn't always like that, was it? No, it was a country music town where gospel was cut, yeah. where rock and roll, that band, the Rolling Stones recorded okay. here. Well, and look Bob those Dylan. guys up, look those guys up. Rolling Stones? Okay. But a lot of people recorded here because of the studios and the musicians, and that's what interested me. I moved here in 79 from the Bay Area. Oh, yeah, I yeah. was a, a steel player, I'm a recovering steel player at this <laughs> point, but I still like that kind of music. I built for a while, I started out building electric guitars. I was very interested in telecast and that music style, and kind of at a time when no one was. Nashville was a pop town. The Telecaster was sort of dead in the water, but I was interested in that sound. It was actually coming from Bakersfield, but because it was pre-internet, I didn't know that. <laughs> right. And you couldn't find out very much from the backs of records. But I moved here and started getting interested in Telecasters and with pitch bending Telecasters, string benders. Uh, so I started building Telecasters and then with Brent Mason, developed the three pickup Tele, which put a center pickup in, which gave it a Strat sound. And he used it to get a sort of special blended Tele sound. And that became kind of the trademark. Fender took that and made the Nashville Tele out of it, but it's what I built, yeah. lots of those. And then uh, kind of got tired of building too much sawdust and, and, <laughs> and lacquer thinner and quit doing that and did repair because it was such a influx of different projects on a daily basis and right. such cool people that I was interested in and whose music I was interested in. I'm just curious, uh, I assume you were probably passionate rock and roll fan as a teenager and you got into playing guitar first. I'm, I'm just curious, the trajectory of like us standing here now. Did you start as just playing in bands and stuff? Or? I started playing blues piano and bass and I'm not very good and never was and realized that I could play for the fun of it but that I was not gonna be a studio player. And playing steel is all about making the pedal singer sound steel? great. Yeah, pedal yeah. steel. It's all about making the singer sound great. So that was kind of my thing was to lay back, be able to play solos but really provide that angel voices kind of sound. That, that beautiful that, bed. Like. That a vocalist sounds great on. That's what I liked doing and I liked traditional vintage country music and, and vintage steel. And when I moved here in 1979, this was a pop world and that just wasn't part of the thing. Okay. So I played for a living, but I wanted to build. Have you always had kind of that engineer's mind, taking things apart? You know, you take it apart and you never put them back together again. That's <laughs> what everybody says. I looked at how they did stuff and there were no tools. There was no nothing. You wanted tools, you made them. You know, this wasn't that long ago, but you made the tools, you figured out the technique, and then the next time you did it differently because of what you learned. And so that's just what I did. I never intended to end up in this business. I did it and then somebody said, could you do this for me? And on and on, and then it's just become what we do. What goes on right here? So this is a machine shop. A certain amount of stuff that seems like it's should have always existed, has never existed. And so I just come in here and, I mean, this just seems like big stuff. You know what that is, right? It's a string tree, Fender style string tree, but it has an extra little hold down for grabbing the G string on a guitar where you don't want to drill a second hole and put a string tree. That seemed like something that in the 60 years or 70 years since Fenders have been around should have existed, but we couldn't find it. And so I came in here and passed the prototypes around and people were like, wow, this is great. So then we made 5,000 of them. So that wouldn't be possible without stuff like this. Wow, that is so cool. What are you working on right now? I see a little mechanism in there. A little piece of brass. I'm making a little prototype for one of the, the string benders that we do, and as a saddle. So we're here talking about the B-Bender now. For the people that don't know out there what it is, it's literally a mechanism in the guitar that when you pull... Let you know, me show you. Yeah, please. You can explain it better than I can. Some people use this on the B-string, and some people use it on the G. This is actually one of Brad Paisley's guitars. He uses the G-string, and I'm not really very well trained on that. But It's worked into a, a particular kind of style. Yeah. He's really good at it. There are actually a lot of people who've made this a big part of their style. There's a little hole underneath the bridge right here. There's a, there's a hole there. If you flip it over, there's a hole back here. 
and there's one long hole that runs through it. Okay. And so it's pretty easy to put together. It takes about 10 minutes to get all the woodworking done. Very lightweight. So the Brad Paisley model, it doesn't come with a B bender? Any fenders come with a B bender? No, not now. They made one years ago okay. with a bender. So you gotta call Joe Glazer to, to get As one in there. As of right now, yes. <laughs> What's interesting about this is that this is set up to bend the G string, but the player can take this out and flip it upside down and use it on the B string. So they don't have to buy it as a G string bender or a B string bender. It's got a, a saddle that's symmetrical. What I wanted to do was make it much easier to install, much faster. It used to take us weeks. Now it takes us a day. We can turn one around a day. We used to have to make all this stuff and design something that could be mass produced and, and so we can put it in very easily and a player can decide they want it on the B or today they want it on the G. I mean, this whole mechanism weighs one and a half times as much as a Fender neck plate does. So it doesn't have any impact on the guitar. Right. And it takes out no wood. It's really got no impact on the guitar. So let's see if I... No? Anywhere you want a, a whole step interval is where you would want to put oh. it. Oh. Because it's a whole a... step. There's a reason why most people always did it on the B. It's an easier way to start. The thing about making benders for people is they would bring us guitars and we put it in, they go, oh, I'm playing the Bluebird tonight, or I'm playing the, the Opry, and I go, don't play that tonight. <laughs> I go, oh no, I'm really excited. They always sound terrible because it, you, you have out. to learn it out. You have to learn the style. Yeah. And there's multiple different styles that work. Years ago, I got this letter that was printed picture, Brad Paisley plays the Virginia Hayride or something. So I'm going to play on the Opry and all this stuff. And But it was already Brad. You could see it. Was he like a child or he a was teenager? 14 years old. Okay, okay. I took it and I showed it to the guys in the shop and went, wow, that's, that's cute. That's cute. This guy's got a dream. <laughs> and we hung it on the wall. And yeah. sure enough, he called me up when he moved to Nashville and said, can I come visit you? And he was so businesslike and so ambitious. It was incredible, and he wanted a bender put in his Paisley Telly, which I did. Something we ordinarily wouldn't do to a vintage guitar, but you could just tell he was on his way. Yeah. I like seeing somebody who's got an idea and then cannot be stopped. Yeah. Now, I'm curious, uh, I don't think I've ever been to a luthier's place that has a 3D printer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can you show me what you do with a 3D printer here? So we're here with Chad. Nice yep. to see you. We've got a really cool looking uh, Gibson here. Yep, it's an old J200 from the 50s. And you're using the 3D printer? So there is a crack that Chad is going to repair. We're going to put a little piece of wood called a cleat on the inside where you can't see it. And we're going to use this little 3D printed application tool that Scott Holyfield, who, who works here, came up with. In the guitar repair industry, uh, whenever there's a crack that develops in the top, after closing up and gluing the crack itself, we like to reinforce the crack from the inside using a piece of spruce. One of the hard things is being able to tell on the inside of a guitar what's going on. What Scott developed was this tool that holds the cleat in place, and then you use it in conjunction with this viewing film. When you put the cleatus inside, you can see exactly where I am. That's actually really cool. And it wouldn't have been very easy to make once we got the 3D printer, not knowing what we were gonna do with it. It's like, well, we could print this thing. And if you look at how complicated it is, it's got a little slot in there, it's got a hole for the magnet. When, when you apply it, you, you put it in there and then tip it down. So it, it can have all these incredible functions and it's so easy to do with a 3D printer and so hard to do without one. So the 3D printer like spits out um, plastic? It's kind of like a glue gun. You've used a glue gun, yeah. right? Yeah. So the 3D printer has this spool of plastic. It goes around like a printer, putting out this little, tiny little thread of hot glue and it just starts to build layer by layer by yeah. layer. And it seems so easy once you see it, but you think about how many hundreds of years it wasn't available. It's so interesting because we're melding technologies with something so vintage. We've got a guitar from the 50s, but yet we're using a 3D printer. Our philosophy is you use whatever provides the best solution. One of the things that we have used now for 30 or so years is carbon fiber to repair things that you just really wouldn't think you would use anything but wood for. I, I can okay. show you can a broken you show neck. Me? Yeah, I'll show you a broken neck that we're doing. All right, so we're talking about carbon fiber? Yes, another material that you wouldn't think that you would use on vintage anything. Right. But that turns out to be the best choice. So we have a nice fat headstock that broke off. We've got a, a rare old gold Thunderbird bass. Belongs to Tom Peterson. He's, he's the bass player in Cheap Trick. Oh yeah. Got a great collection. This had a terminal break in the headstock, meaning that it broke straight across and, and it, kind of a butt break, which, which you can't really glue. It wouldn't hold anything. So we glued it back together again and cut down into the wood about a sixteenth of an inch and laid in carbon fiber cloth. Oh wow. It's thin it's soft. It's like what you could make pajamas out of. Do you use heat? No. You do have to use ceramic scissors because nothing will cut this. Okay. Scissors won't cut it. Before carbon fiber was 
really available in the late 80s. We used fiberglass and it could tear again. Since we've been doing this, not a single one has ever broken. And then Scott will come back in and paint old looking gold. Is he gonna just eyeball? Yeah, it we'll, we'll match, match the color and you will not be able to tell that this base ever broke there. It's completely smooth across yeah. that. You glue it? You glue it. We use a very hard epoxy and locks the carbon fiber into place. The fibers themselves don't stretch at all. So they end up creating this surface like metal only stronger per weight than metal by a tremendous amount. So it won't bend, won't break, which is why it's used, why carbon fiber is used in airplanes. But what I like about it is it, it looks like the very wrong thing to do to a guitar, mm, except right. it's the only way to save it. And when it gets done, it will not be visible. I was just going to ask how much longer before it's completely repaired. Well, it'll get lacquer on top and it'll take a few weeks to cure out. The, the guy that owns it is going to go, where? No, what? Wow. But it's kind of the theme of use whatever makes the best job right. that honors the tradition. That is so cool. All right, so we've got the Pleck machine. You said it's German. It looks fairly German. Well, this one's pretty old. This one's 12 or 13 years old. The new ones are about a third this size. It's a CNC tool. It's extremely precise. It will do anything that a guitar repair person, builder, wants to do in their own style, but very, very accurately, and so it will remember that. It'll f fix things? It'll dress the frets. It'll cut the slots in a nut. It will cut the slots in a fingerboard where you want to put frets in. It will put a slot in an acoustic bridge, do inlay, a whole variety of things. Its forte is dressing frets, planing the fingerboard, and cutting nut slots. So we put a guitar in here. This is a cool, feels like a 56 Strat. This is one of Vince Gill's. Vince Gill's guitar yeah, in here? Yeah. And he wants the frets slightly lowered, and he wants additional licks added to the guitar. Don't we all? Out of all the people out there, I don't think he needs them. You know, a guitar, Sitting like this and sitting like this are very different because of the weight of the neck. But sitting like this and this, are they are not. So we put it in that way. We just very lightly strap it in so it's just really sitting of its own weight and then close it and run a quick scan on it. So it's scanning now, and what it's looking at is the shape of the fingerboard, the neck. It's looking at how high the strings are, where they are on the neck, and then how high the frets are in each place along the neck. And the idea is that frets, they need to be extremely accurate yeah. in their height. Even though it's not really a straight line, an ideal neck should not be straight, it has a fret plane. We call that the fret plane, the group of frets. That needs to be a very precise geometric shape. Interestingly enough, one thing we've learned from studying people's favorite guitars is that the higher the action, not everybody plays super low because if you want to really be able to dig in or you want a lot of dynamics, you have to play pretty high. Most of my customers play pretty high. The higher the action, the more relief or curve you want in the fingerboard. So all that's built into this. So for instance, let's say like Eric Clapton, he has a certain setup that he likes on a Strat. Could he send you yes. like a new Strat and say, open up the Clapton settings and dial it in the way I like it? In fact, what we're going to do on this guitar is Vince has this 58 Strat, it was Dwayne Eddy's guitar. Yeah. It's, just the, it's the guitar. Not because it was Dwayne's, it just happens to be, but it is the best guitar. And he loves the way that one's set up. And so we're going to take these frets down a little bit to be exactly like that other one, which we have on file here. And so we know not kind of how we remember it, but exactly how it was. But I'll just show you really quickly. That's sort of what the like shows. That's a blow up of this. This is what you see if you look down on the edge of a guitar. Because you're wanting to see incredible detail. We blow them up and this is what a fret looks like. This is a fret right there. And what we're really looking at is the surface. The red line is where the frets really are and the green line is where it should be for his action, his string gauge, the way he wants to play. And so what we're gonna do is lower him down a little bit. And so this is basically kind of a video game like way to approach it, except that you can decide every single bit of what you want to do on this guitar compared to another guitar, or if he grips really hard and we want to lower the frets up in the first position where he's gripping, because not that he does, but if somebody does and they're pulling himself out of tune, you can just take this whole thing and lower the area you want. You can put a, a bending dress so that, so that you can take a fender neck with a lot of radius and flatten it out up the neck. So you can really impose what you as an experienced luthier want and then remember it forever. Not bad. Not bad. We like having that technology. And then it does it really, really accurately. Before I got one of these, I made fun of it. I said, uh, not in a million years. Yeah. Call me back in the year one, comma, yeah. zero, 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 comma, zero. Yeah. You know. And people who don't have it tend to be afraid of it. They go, well, it's not, doesn't have the art. 
You put acoustics in here? Acoustics, seven string basses, ukulele, mandolin. Islands or fiddles or no? You know, that might not be out of the question because... They don't have frets. But the fingerboard is like if they had infinite number of frets. Is there a kind of standard for the neck? Fender supposedly makes 7.5 inch radius, but because they're sand, you know, they make this thing and then they're sanding on it and some guy's thinking about lunchtime and pretty soon he's changed the radius. And <laughs> so there's no standard. You were doing most of your job before you had Oh one. yeah, by hand. Thousands and thousands of fret dresses and we'd been treated really well, like, oh, you guys do such great fret work. And then I saw what we really did and the things that bugged me, the little things that still bugged me were clear as day. It was humbling for me. Well, Joe, thanks so much for showing this awesome machine. Thank it's you for it's such a cool thing. And I love seeing the combination of like craftsmanship with technology. We build a lot of guitar related software and it might be something that your vast world of followers out there would contribute to, which would be incredible and good for everybody. So Josh, hey, nice to see you, man. Yeah, you too, Marty. So we were talking about technology and we're moving on over here to sure. some cool thing that you guys yeah, are working on. A rare thing to talk about in a guitar repair shop. If you wander to any other shop in the world, you'll never see the kind of setup that you got here with the plate machine and we're, 3D printer. Right? And it's pretty amazing. Yeah, they got a, a healthy spread of unique tactics. And tell me about this. The program or? Yeah, so it's actually a number of programs. I've been working with Joe for three plus years, okay. building out his fantasies. And All one right. of them is this program that's actually right behind us, Shop well, you may have noticed that there is computers at everybody's bench. Yes. And that's where they are working actively on work orders, managing the spread of tasks that have to happen in a repair shop. So we're running timers on everything that goes down. Okay. And a number of additional tools like measuring setup at the bench, speaking to the plug machine. The guys can communicate with each other through the notes. I mean, it just, it makes the repair process that much more potent and efficient and you can keep track of who's working and who's on a cigarette break. It's combing out what is one of the real challenges for repair, which is to keep track of who, what, when, why, how to be able to go back five years and, and figure out what did you do and why and how much did you do it and how long did it take you? Did you make any money doing it? All that stuff was one of the things that really complicated our world. So we first built a shop management software. We didn't want to build it. We just looked around and there was nothing very good that was out there. And so this is a very comprehensive shop management software. But inside of that, a photo resource of many detailed shots so that a collector or a builder, repair person, or just somebody who's curious can learn about guitars. There's actually eight total projects that we're actively moving. Another one of them is Guitar Wikipedia or Gitwick. Gitwick. Yeah, Gitwick. Amazing stuff comes to the shop all the time, and it's a missed opportunity if we don't take photographs of it while it's broken. Yeah. You'll never get the photograph of the inside of the potentiometer, and these this, these photos don't exist anywhere. Right. And they've become a pretty potent resource for other repair shops. So anyone out there can go on to Gitwick? Oh yeah, go to gitwick.com. G-I-T-W-I-K. They can do it with their cell phone camera. Yeah. That's good enough. It doesn't have to be old. It doesn't have to be rare because sooner or later somebody wants to know what the details on a 1997 Ibanez are. And right. it may not be a collector's item, but if you want to find something out, if you go to Google and look at it, you might find a front picture. You might find a back picture, but you're not going to find all this other so stuff. So Gitwick is like a comprehensive database of guitar. It sends you through a very simple guide shots and you take that one click. If something's missing, if the bridge is wrong, you still put it in there and you can put, please to somebody, um, a wish list, add the bridge because some information is better than no information. George Groon and uh, Walter actually look over the photos to make sure that we don't have a bunch of garbage on the website. So. Gotcha. Crowdsourced repository for detailed instrument photos. The other day, a, a Gibson L00 came in and had no side markers. Really? And the question was, is it supposed to have side markers? Oh, right. And you can you, you were able to jump in here and reference when. Pull it up. Yeah. So that's it, Gibson L00. They were made in the 30s. A bunch of directed photos so it tells you which photos to take the best you can so if we go down to the to the neck views you see this says neck group zoom and there's no side markers on L00 there's no there's nothing on line where you could find that that easily and it's it's all pretty user friendly how long has Gitwick existed upwards of four years okay we're constantly developing it just like all this stuff and the idea is it will never be finished but if people can contribute anything to it they're doing a great thing. This is really the only place where you can walk and say, hey, what was my guitar set up like three years ago? And we easily have that information. What about overlap of just the same guitars over and over? Cherry picks the best. Oh, this isn't, let's see every 59 Les Paul. There are books for that. This right. is, 
Here's a 59 Les Paul with a weird variant. It's got a different decal than they ever used. Let's add that. Yes. But not necessarily just have 60 59 yeah. Les Pauls. I understood. Very understood. good question though. Yeah. But someone like Maple Byrne, yeah. we're at some point gonna go over and photograph all that stuff because he's got things that you will never, ever see. Right, I've never seen anything like Maple's uh, place. What's so amazing is that he's just the most unassuming guy and he spent his life putting together a world-class collection. And just a vinyl collection too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, just wanna thank Joe Glazer again. Thank you, sir, Thank you so much. for showing us into your world. It's so kind of you. I'm gonna leave a link for the Gitwick. Check that out. Keep inspiring and thank you again. Well, thanks for what you're doing. It, it means a lot to a lot of people.